Welcome back to the channel. In the previous video, we cut a lawn that was overgrown, and here we are in the backyard. Now, uh, it was a mess. It was pretty hairy, pretty nasty, and uh, we're going to get it back in shape. And as you can see, we're using a weed eater. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. First and foremost was because I had a tire that kept going flat on my 36 inch X mark, and on this particular job, I pulled it out of the trailer and it went flat. Um, it ended up having a hole in the sidewall, which is an easy fix, uh, but we swapped it with one of our other spare tires that we have, and our shop's not too far from here, from this particular job site. Uh, our shop is run through our garage. So, you know, when I say shop, I don't want you to think we have something extravagant. We are a smaller company running our business out of basically our household. You know, our office is in our house, our shop is in our house we're a small growing business probably not too different from you um, so in this particular job though we had to weed eat this backyard and I would have probably gone this route with uh, pretty large areas of this backyard whether or not the mower had gone down um, one of the big reasons why is on jobs like this you'll find a lot of um, debris or things that you wouldn't know were in the property and this is one of those properties that just seems to have that type of stuff. Now you can pull up to some yards that they're overgrown and you just know there's really not anything in there, but there is a certain level of safety that you want to keep in mind because if you hit something, it's going to not only damage your equipment, but there is a possibility that it could, uh, well, it could hurt you or it could hurt somebody else. So having said that, we do what we had to do. We slammed it down. It's not the first one. Now, when we uh, took care of this backyard, I believe, let me zoom out here. Yeah, that's right. I believe it took about 20 minutes uh, to take care of this backyard, which, you know, is what it is. It's a first time cut. We charge on an hourly basis, so it's okay. Um, we did leave it a mess. You know, when you weedy, it's going to leave a lot of grass clippings on the ground. We didn't rake that up. We didn't mow it up. We didn't shred it up. We didn't try to clean it up. We just slammed it to the ground and left it. Now over the next week it dried out and it made it to where it was easier to shred up with the mower on the next visit. So obviously it's had grass sitting on it all week. Then when we come and shred it up, it's, it's gonna be a little yellow underneath. And after about three cuts, on the third cut, this yard was looking really pretty sharp. And it was back to looking like a manicured lawn, which is what I, notified my client of when I picked him up I said hey it's gonna take about two to three cuts to get your property looking good again that's what I always say when I run into these properties because they are always um, well it's, it's just gonna be a mess and it's gonna be a lot of work to, to get it cleaned up on the first time but the other thing is when you're cutting that much grass off of any lawn it's gonna look so rough that it's gonna be yellowed up it's gonna look nasty it's not gonna look real even it's it's just not going to look manicured. So don't give them unrealistic expectations. They know their lawn hasn't been cut all year. When you pick something up like this, make sure they know, hey, here's a realistic expectation. We're going to get your property looking good again, but it's going to take two to three cuts to look well manicured. They're going to say, okay. Now, James and I are both going at it. What we like to do is kind of break yards up into sections when we do this. Uh, so I'll kind of go around and I'll make a square you know, um, kind of like you're weed eating the perimeter on a certain section. And then I knock out that square. And then James is over here. He's actually weed eating up against the house. And he's going to knock out another section kind of in a similar fashion as well. So for him, this whole section behind the house next to the shed is what he broke up into a square. And that's what he's going to knock out there. So overall, it's, it's not too bad of a job. Um, it's not what we like to do every day. But they do pay good uh, if you are confident. Know how much work it is. Don't undersell yourself. I used to walk into this all the time and say, yeah, 50 bucks, you know. And uh, then I'd spend a couple hours there and I'd go, ugh. But uh, here's a fine example of what I was talking about. Uh, coming up right here, there's actually a weight in the ground. Um, and I knew there was some, some kind of weird stuff because there was a shed here with like animals uh, for maybe goats or something were kept there in the past. I knew it was going to be something odd in the yard. So if I had to run the mower through here, I would have definitely hit this weight with the chains on it and uh, would have probably busted a spindle on my mower. 
Now, if you have to replace a spindle on your mower, you're probably going to spend somewhere in the ballpark of 300 bucks. If you're lucky and you own a Toro or another manufacturer, I don't know about modern Toros, but I have some older Toros. And if you have uh, bearings that can be rebuilt, you can buy new spindle bearings and actually rebuild them yourself. But they are going to take time to break down and uh, put back together. So uh, if you end up doing that, if you ever have to replace a spindle bearing, remember that if you put your bearings in the freezer about 30 minutes to an hour ahead of time, they will slide right into the housing. So just a quick tip, if you ever have to do that, put your bearings in the freezer. Don't do it the other way around. You'll have difficulty trying to hammer them into the housing, okay? Uh, the reason why that works is because metal contracts when it gets cold and it expands when it gets hot. So put your bearings in the freezer and it'll slide right in. That trick has saved me uh, several times. I learned that from my uh, father. Um, I may have learned it from my grandfather. I don't know. There's the two people that I call when I'm going, hey, uh, what do I do here? I haven't been in this particular situation. And uh, while we're talking about maintenance, I will say that as a um, business owner, I've had to learn how to maintain a lot of my equipment. And the reason being is in the beginning of my business, I... I seem to only be able to land work like this. This is what I gravitated to um, or what gravitated to me is a lot of cleanups, a lot of stuff that was rough and hard on the equipment. And uh, I wasn't getting paid good, so I had to work on my own stuff. Since then, we generally take um, our two-stroke equipment, our weed eaters and blowers and stuff like that. We take them to the shop because we all have the extras, but I don't have spare mowers. So I have a 61 and a 36. I'd love to have backups of both. We currently don't have that. So whenever something goes wrong with that equipment, I have to fix it on the fly so that we can continue mowing that day or get back on track the next day. Uh, that is, uh, it is a problem. It, it's, you know, kind of like having a, uh, you know, it's, it's like just a ticking time bomb throughout the season. Something's gonna go wrong. And the same thing goes if you only have one truck you want to have a backup um, or know that at some point in time something might break down. You're going to have to breathe and you're going to have to fix it. It's going to be all right. You're going to keep going. But you have to know that you have the confidence in yourself that you're going to make things happen. Now, as far as that uh, maintenance, like I said, that's something I do myself. Uh, I just bring it to the shop and I learn how to do it if I don't know how to do it. I'll look it up on YouTube. I've learned a lot from YouTube. I've learned a lot from having conversations with people that, uh, you know, work on their own stuff. I've had to do everything in my business. I've had to do everything from clean the carburetors on the mower to clean the carburetor on my old black Chevy. I had to pull out the transmission on my black Chevy to change the clutch. Um, I've had to replace uh, U-joints and bearings and uh, pull engines on mowers and swap them. There's always something that comes up and something new that you're going to have to try um, if you're going to stay in business. It's just, it's just like a constant test. And you're going to find out that each time it happens, it doesn't bother you as much. You still have anxiety with something new if you had to fix it. You'll still have that anxiety, but you'll have the confidence in yourself that you can make it happen. If you're not mechanically inclined, I suggest that you... Do your best to figure it out or understand you're going to have to charge accordingly. That needs to be in your cost. You're going to have to do enough jobs to, to make enough money that you'll be able to have somebody else work on it. Or find a mechanic that is a, a smaller... I like when I was starting and I did have to take something to somebody occasionally. It's very good to have somebody that has a smaller shop, not a large company. And um, The reason being is the smaller shops will charge a little less. But uh, the main reason is they'll have, they'll generally be able to get your mower to you quicker. That's what I've noticed. I'm not saying they're all like that, but that's what I've noticed. Uh, some of the larger businesses and dealerships, they tend to take, you know, a week or two to get your uh, mower back. And that's just something we're not able to do. So back onto the job, you know, it's, it's pretty hairy, pretty nasty, pretty tall. Uh, we both had to change our weed eater string on this. Um, the backyard was not as fun as the front. And here you're seeing James, he's weed eating from the top to the bottom on this plant. 
Uh, that's a pretty good way to take care of thistles and stuff like that that are growing real tall and nasty. Um, otherwise, they'll just lay down and lay thick. And this area was kind of thin, so it wasn't too bad anyways. But James seems to handle this stuff uh, pretty well. He's, he's getting uh, pretty good at running the weed eater. Like a bird on a tree. I'm just sitting here. I got time, it's clear to see From up here, the world seems small We can sit together It's so beautiful, you and me we meant to be Outdoors, forever free. So whenever you're messing with older properties, you'll always see um, kind of oddball stuff. Like this one has, like I said, the um, animal pens over there in the back. It's got a fire pit in the middle of the yard that hasn't been used in, in who knows how long. Um, and it's just compiled rocks from what was probably in the yard to begin with. As well as um, we've got this odd flower bed over here, which I'm guessing was a vegetable garden and some, some uh, sheds. When you get into older neighborhoods and you get into the older properties like this, you'll find a lot of odd obstacles. This is actually, uh, in comparison to a lot of older properties I have um, or have had in the past, this one really doesn't have too many obstacles. I've had some that are just crazy, like oddball flowers in the middle of the yard they don't want you to hit, oddball little beds. Uh, there's always something that's just the homeowner DIY I, I, oh, I think that looked pretty right there I don't really know what I'm doing with landscape but I'm just gonna you know, let's pick that spot right there on the ground and that's what you'll find a lot with the older properties so it makes it kind of a pain you don't have a whole lot of uh, straight shots sometimes and that's something to uh, consider when you're taking on a property is just how much work you're gonna have so my properties that I generally take on now the neighborhoods I go after uh, they're more of built between uh, the 70s to early 2000s and um, they don't have many obstacles now those older homes in the 70s you'll find some obstacles but for the most part they're pretty clean pretty bare slate so that's that's kind of my opinion that's what I like I can easily bid those online and not have to worry about crazy obstacles and if I do show up there's something here or there it's normally something that I can just deal with it's not, it's not too much normally so while you're out here cutting these crazy lawns trying to make a buck try to remember what you're doing it for you know are you doing it to take care of your family? Are you growing the business to uh, build yourself something better in life? Or, you know, for me, it's not only taking care of my family, but uh, taking care of my mental health. I don't ever want to work in a factory again. I don't want to feel constrained. Um, and you, as you're building a business, it can feel like you're mentally trapped inside. And like there's nobody else with you sometimes and uh, I just want to let you know it's not not that way and uh, you can really turn this into something amazing if you slow yourself breathe 
listen to yourself, make the right decisions, take the emotion out of your decision. I know that there's been a lot of times where I was so hungry for work because I thought just getting another job, getting that this one more job and that one more job, bringing in a little bit of money was what was going to change it for me. If I just got a little more and a little more and a little more, when in reality, if I just said no to a few things that I didn't want to do that weren't good for me, if I just had the confidence to raise my value just a little bit, raise my income just a little bit by changing my value proposition with the client and demanding a little bit more for my service. Well, then I can really make some changes in my life. But it'll take you a minute to stop and breathe. And, uh, yeah, I just want to let you know that if you're, if you're out there and you're struggling right now, if it's hot, you're, you're miserable, just keep in mind, tell yourself that you're a juggernaut, and keep pushing through it. Don't let burnout take you. Build your business. It's going to be good. You just have to put in the work. Okay, now right here, uh, James's weed eater got slugged up, and I had to let him know here that uh, he needed to pull that out by hand because he was trying to get it loose by just giving it more throttle and spinning it until it came off. But you need to just be real careful with doing that because what's going to happen is you can actually burn your head up on your weed eater doing that. Um, so, yeah, just be careful. Take your time. Uh, right after he did it, I did it. And, you know, it's just something that happens occasionally. Take your time. Get it pulled out. Um, and get back to work. So I wanted to take a second um, just to speak with you. I know that if you made it this far, you're probably, you've been down the same road that I have been, or you, you're going through the same struggle. And one of the things I want to let you know um, is that it's going to be all right. So let's go ahead and take a second, all right? Out of the book, uh, Colossians. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As working for the Lord and not human masters so I want you to take a second and think about that if you just put passion into what you're doing as though you're working for something greater not as though you're working at a factory anymore not as though you're working at fast food or whatever that job was you were at and another one to remember is Proverbs 14 23 and all hard work there is profit but in the talk of the lips, it leads only to poverty. So remember to do more than what you say. Put everything that you are into everything that you do. You're going to succeed.